Um, we have a great panel also for you here today to talk about this. We have Nuri Katz, who is the, who's, uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer at UCLA and an Anderson alum herself. So Nuri, please come on up. We've got uh, Professor Matthew Kahn, who's an environmental economist. He recently put out a book, uh, Climatopolis, and it's basically the future of big cities in, uh, you know, if you understand global warming is an inevitability, here's how big cities are gonna adapt. And last but not least, we have our very own Zach Goldman. Uh, Zach, <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to travel with Zach, um, but only recently did I learn about his background. He has a background very similar to Layla's, and Zach actually co-founded a company called uh, Mall, Mall Sustainability uh, Partners, and he worked on a lot of the same stuff that, uh, that Layla does, so you know, it's great to have him up here. So uh, just give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> so before we start a whole talk on sustainability, it's worth, you know, without, at the risk of rehashing the obvious, what is sustainability? And I took this from uh, the UCLA website, so Nareet, this may, <laughs> this may sound familiar. Uh, but we have, it says, sustainability presumes that resources are finite and should be used conservatively and wisely with a view to long-term priorities and the consequences of the way these resources are gonna be used. So with that in mind, I wanna ask each one of you, uh, why is sustainability so important? Start off with that. Sure. So there are a lot of different, you know, ways of defining sustainability. Um, one of the most common definitions comes from the um, the UN, uh, which is the definition of sustainability as meeting our present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So ultimately, you know, as cliche as it might sound, sustainability is about the kids. It's about our, our children and our grandchildren and the future generations to come. Um, and so it's important for that reason, if you believe that human life is at all important. Um, and as a consideration, it's a matter of, of really understanding the long-term you know, perspective. So sustainability is important if you, if you care about the future, if you want to you know, end human civilization now, then we're good. We can just enjoy the year, and, and we're fine. Mm -hmm. I, I would uh, agree with Nareet and add just one fun science fiction point. I, when I teach my students, uh, I, in my own crazy way, start talking about a time machine. Would, would you prefer to live now, in the past, or in the future? And since we can't do a back to the future, at least not yet, maybe, maybe some of these TED entrepreneurs can figure this out, I agree with Marie that there's certain investments we can make now so that my 11-year-old son, uh, Alex, could be an Anderson class of 2025. And, and, and I'm always an optimist, but I, I, my mother always says to not engage in wishful thinking. And the sustainability agenda is, as Marie just said, a way to guarantee that the next generation has it at least as good as we've had it. So I'm also a fan of Von Brundtland uh, definition that we want to meet the, the needs of the present without sacrificing the future. But I, I spent a lot of my time talking to businesses. And in that particular context, it became about how do we ensure future profitability. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to meet Paul Pullman, who's CEO of Unilever, a company that's been fairly aggressive in a lot of the things they're doing around their products. And he said, look, my goal, he goes, I want to double the size of my business in the next few years, and I need to have my environmental impact to make that happen. This isn't just about, look, the, the importance of, of providing a better life for everybody in the future is, is paramount, but from the perspective of Unilever, I need to make sure that we can get the inputs that we need to make soap, to make cocoa, to make tea, with, you know, all the various things that they put out there. He goes, so I need to look up my supply chain, mm -hmm. and I need to talk to the folks that are growing my cocoa, do, you know, producing my rubber, producing my palm oil, and make sure that this is done as sustainably as possible so I can get this stuff to produce all the things that I sell to you. Right. Right. Which I think, if I may, I think that those are one and the same. I think the better life or the life for your kids in the future, you know, we're all here at at the business school because we believe that business is part of that and being able to sustain a business and profitability is part of you know fitting those two together. It's not just sustainability is sustainability and not environment alone for that reason because it understands the interaction between the economy and environment. So that's a great point. Yeah. So you know 
listening to Layla speak, the big takeaway I took from, from her talk was she's pushing us towards a new way of thinking about sustainability. And she gives the example of the paper versus plastic bag, or better yet, the, uh, the tea kettle, and how you know right now we think of sustainability as what are the uh, ingredients going in to make the product, mm -hmm. and then the energy usage. But she was talking about thinking about how it's actually being used in the real world, and then adapting that to make it more sustainable over its entire life. So I wanted to ask uh, Professor Khan, um, are there similar policies out there right now, environmental, economic policies, that almost promote this wrong way of thinking about sustainability or incentivize the wrong behavior? And what should we do about that? So uh, a couple of old school examples, and I hope everyone loves their law of demand. When I, I do, it's been very good to me. And with that kettle, how did all that water end up in that kettle? And folks, I had an evil thought. The price of water in England is too low. If the price of water had been a little higher, would, would folks be a little more careful filling that kettle? And same with that lettuce. I'm going to get uh, the agricultural interests on me. But if there were smaller subsidies for agriculture, would the price of a lettuce perhaps be higher? And would folks perhaps not have so many rotting in their fridge? Right. And so part of the discussion has to be the price of resources, electricity, water, and I, I, how we set those prices like Goldilocks just right mm -hmm. to balance uh, marginal cost pricing, but then not creating starvation out of how we get the price right, right. for its scarce resources. Right. And then, Marie, uh, with your work with the university and, and with the city of Westwood, uh, do you encounter these sorts of things where there's the wrong incentives or policies and, and how do we go about kind of making that better? Yeah, um, that's a big question, of course. But definitely, I think the policies make a difference. I, I think, you know, Layla's focus on design is a critical one. I'm actually teaching a course right now for UCLA Extension for our certificate program on design sustainability. And um, one of the examples that I use with the students is I remember, and they've gotten better, but when biodegradable garbage bags first came out, I remember trying to use one, and it did biodegrade, but it biodegraded like, you know, as I was trying to put trash in it, <laughs> it fell apart, which isn't very useful. And so, um, you know, part of it, I think, is, as she was saying, changing how our designers think and how, you know, how our understanding of life cycle analysis is. But, you know, we have a policy here at UCLA that we're trying to get to zero waste to landfill, and that's something that a lot of cities and institutions have adopted. Um, and overall, it's a positive goal. One of the problems with it that I don't have a solution for yet is that it focuses on one piece of the life cycle, which is the end of use of the product. But um, sometimes, as she was pointing to, the, when you take the full life cycle perspective, something that might be better for end of life cycle can still have an overall more negative impact. Um, and so, for an example, when people have zero waste policies where it's focused on end of life, they end up making purchasing decisions and buying a lot of compostable and biodegradable products, which she explained very well, sometimes isn't best overall environment. And so, I'd like to see maybe policies that actually legislate a better life cycle approach. For instance, our purchasing policy is pretty vague and says do the more environmentally friendly thing, but if we were able to work in um, some sort of mandate around taking a more life cycle approach, that might be helpful. Uh, I would know, I think that kind of relates back to what you said, Professor. When you appropriately account for the costs of the inputs, suddenly people become amazingly creative yeah. and rethinking uh, you know, how things should be treated at the end of their life cycle. Uh, you know, Layla talked about, about mobile phones, right? And um, you know that that, as we know, there's a lot of gold, there's a lot of heavy metals uh, in those devices. And I'll tell you, I'm still lugging around a uh, a BlackBerry, and to produce <laughs> wow. the yeah, no, that's, 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 that's one that will soon be uh, hopefully not in a drawer. Uh, to get the gold in the circuit board to produce this phone, you produce something like 100 kilograms, about 220 pounds of mine tailings. Uh, now we know that already there's, there's big business in you know, cracking open the circuit boards and, and extracting those metals, uh, but also can, you can get creative with, with reuse. Um, I know there's a company called Brightstar and a few other firms out there that have gotten into the business of capturing these things and um, getting them to people who would not, excuse me, not otherwise have access to smartphones. So we're not even talking about breaking down and appropriately treating it at the end of life, we're talking about keeping something in the cycle longer. 
there's a group out of San Diego called Eco APM. You, uh, you feed it your phone at the end of life, it gives you some pittance for, I don't know, 25 bucks for your, for your smartphone. But the, it eventually ends up in some place like India. You, the memory's been wiped. Uh, you've got some up and coming uh, dude over there who wants to get in his hands. Maybe on a Blackberry. I think they still use BBM over there. Um, and you can get access to the smartphone for $80, $8,500. There's a huge profit in it for, for the firm that's become the arbitrator. Uh, you know, I think it's a way to take advantage of global supply chains right. and information networks. So I wondered a little bit, but there's a lot yeah. of value to be captured in this. Stuff. And in the same way, you know, I think he brings up a really good point that there's a hierarchy of benefit um, and reuse and you know, cutting waste in the first place is better than recycling. Right. Yet a lot of the time we're focused on, on recycling in the same way she talks about in design, we focus on materials and, and things like that. But for instance, you know, if you talk about a sustainable shoe, people will want to know, you know what it's made of, just like she was saying. But durability is something that's often not looked at. You know, if your shoe falls apart in a year and you have to buy a new shoe, then that has an impact. And so getting us to move up in that hierarchy and think about eliminating waste in the first place and reuse, mm -hmm. I think, goes a long way as well. Okay. And so I wanted to throw a couple challenges at you because it all sounds like nice and rosy, okay. but uh, Professor, uh, when I think about economic growth, a lot of that depends on us buying stuff. So we're producing new stuff, <laughs> and we're consuming new stuff, and the GDP curve goes up. If we take Layla's guidance, we're buying less stuff, we're producing less stuff, are, you know, are we gonna have flat growth, are we gonna have negative growth? What, what are the macroeconomic implications if we all adopted that tomorrow? So as one of the world's worst macroeconomists, I can give only a, a quick answer. <laughs> so in a world, I would take the money that I, was no longer spending on products and give it to the Anderson School to, to lower tuition or students. <laughs> 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 we, we are amazing at finding new uses of our money. I think the service economy, when I moved to Los Angeles, a woman volunteered to be my life coach, and I'm not sure what that meant, but <laughs> that was, she clearly thought I needed one. And, and so there's always, there's always services. If you've satiated basic durables wants, you can turn to the services market, especially in Los Angeles. Okay, all right. And I don't think she was actually calling for less consumption. She was, I think, calling for smarter consumption and more importantly, smarter manufacturing and use of goods. So we're making all these cell phones, but if we make them so they're easily disassemblable and we can capture the resources at the end, then you're eliminating a lot of the impact. Okay. So, I mean, a lot of sustainability, unfortunately, people tend to have this mindset of scarcity, like we're running out of stuff and we just have to stop buying things. But if we are smarter, like I think, you know, she mentioned 40% of food is wasted. But if you look at manufacturing, a lot of products that are produced and 99% of the what they're using, like coffee, I think, uses 2% of the coffee plant and the rest is going to waste. So if we even begin to start to better utilize the resources that we do have, we might not you know, face the same challenge, and we can still produce goods and have a good life, but do it in a way that's smart and cyclical, if that makes sense. Okay, all right, and I, I guess that leads into the, the next point, um, you know, about the, the activities that we'll be doing on campus. Uh, university, especially UC, is very cash-strapped, so resources that would be going to other things are going to, uh, to our zero-waste efforts. What, um, what are, can you talk about the benefits to students? <laughs> that was quite a loaded statement. I don't, know, I don't know if that's true, actually. I mean, we've been able to save millions of dollars okay. for the university through energy efficiency. We are working with limited resources, and because of that, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of UCLA sustainability programs is that we've taken a very smart financial approach, and we're focused, for the most part, on initiatives that actually save the university money. Okay. Double-sided printing, you're cutting in half the amount of paper the university is using. Um, switching to tap water, filtered tap water instead of bottled water, not that everybody's done that yet, but if we were to, that's millions of dollars saved. So that, I think embedded in your question was a myth that most people have, which is that green is gonna cost more. And sometimes it does, but a lot of the time, sustainability is ultimately about cutting waste, and cutting waste is just good business, right. so. On the filtered water system, I don't know if any of you guys go into the Wuhan Center, they've got the, the, the filters the there, station, and there's yeah. a, the little counter in terms of how many bottles that we would saved. I think uh -huh. it's up to, as of this morning, it was about 78,000 bottles nice. uh, in the last year, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Really cool. You know, I think that's what we're trying to demonstrate, is this, 
this, this doesn't have to be something that costs an institution money. It can actually be something that saves money. But you know, there are some things do still cost more, and so we're focused on the strategies, and there's plenty of right. them that you know would save resources for the university. But, but where, where Ira is right is that many green investments do have upfront expenditure. Right. And then you get into payback periods and uh, and the ability to borrow. And UCLA, I hope so, has a triple A Moody's rating. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I it should. And 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 but the ability to finance upfront investments is crucial in making tr transition to okay. sustainable investments. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you and we are debt financing some of those energy efficiency projects for exactly that reason. So someone asked me about the results. Could, would you mind talking quickly about some of the results? I know because we sure. we've hit our some of our goals for 2012 already. Yeah, I mean, sustainability is really broad. So, you know, I deal with everything from energy and greenhouse gas emissions to food purchasing to, you know, water use. So I probably I don't want to take, you know, too much time with the panel. There's a lot of information online. But, you know, we have made a lot of really good progress. We've been able, so one of the things we do that totally relates to um, Layla's talk is we actually, we have a cogeneration plant on campus. Cogeneration is combined heat and power. That means we generate most of our power ourselves using a very efficient technology. So we burn fuel to generate electricity, and then we capture the waste heat that comes off of that to make steam and chilled water to heat and cool the campus. And 6% of our gas right now actually comes from Mountain Gate Landfill over on Sepulveda. Mm -hmm. So she was talking about recapturing methane. Um, we've actually been doing that for a long time, and we'd take more, but we take all we have. So um, hopefully in the future, we'll find other good sources of biogas that are affordable. Um, but through building that plant and through early energy efficiency, we've been able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, per square foot by 27% since 1990. So basically, the bottom line is we've grown 40% of the campus. We've added 8 million square feet. That's like building 4,000 homes. And we've been able to keep our GHG almost level during that time, which is pretty outstanding. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, here's one. Folks, I'm going to run off this stage, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to make, so I wanted to come back to something Marie just said, and something I, I was not sure on, that, that human ingenuity, uh, the, the excellent staff that UCLA has put together on sustainability can effectively enhance our natural resources. And so, whilst the speaker had that diagram of the limited earth, I am sort of a new age guy of <laughs> believing that, that human ingenuity, uh, if effectively increases our supply of natural resources uh, for some of the reasons that Marie just sketched. Okay. But this was a great panel, folks. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Right. 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 So we, have a, we have a few minutes left. I'll ask a couple more questions and we'll open up to the audience. So, um, as, you know, I'm sold. Sounds like this is a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Got me. So what are some of the next steps we should be doing? Uh, Zach, you were in the private sector. Sure. so. You know, we're business students, we want to go out into the world. What are business opportunities we could take on to further this? I mean, one of the things I saw out there in the private sector is two types of uh, sustainability initiatives in the corporate world. You either have top down or bottom up. And I mean, that's one of many ways to divide it, but there were more bottom up than top down. So a lot of the corporate programs where I went in and sat down with people had generally been young managers, people not that far out of business school or whatever their backgrounds were trying to get something going within their organization. Uh, the stuff that seemed very important to me uh, to be effective, you have to develop a business case for anything you're going to talk about. And, and, and in the private sector, I don't know what it is, but in the university, you'd be talking about 12 to 18 month paybacks. I mean, these are really high return targets to pay for any sort of initiative you're going to recommend. So a lot of it had to do with energy efficiency. There's a lot to be done uh, with, with, with uh, logistics, with packaging and distribution. That's what people go after first. Um, the other thing that really is critical as you get out into your career and you want to pursue this in your organization is look for cross-functionality as well. Uh, the programs that I saw within corporations that were working uh, were people that were not just housed within one, one part of the company, but were able to think about this holistically, to take a, a systems approach, I guess. And if you're in engineering and you want to be working on you know, having the product be more energy efficient, you need to be talking to folks in supply chain, you need to be talking to folks who are in the marketing side of the company. Uh, you need to make sure that you bring in as much of your organization as you can. Okay. And um, in terms of us as students, you know, in campus at UCLA or living in the Westwood area, what are things that we could do locally? Just in terms of impact, or do you mean in pre preparation for your career? Uh, I mean more impact on like the local, because I think um, sure. a, a lot of what, what they talk about at TED is, is wonderful and brilliant. 
but it seems so hard to reach out and grab. It's very, you know, yeah. Elon Musk wants to talk about rockets that land themselves and then we're going to go to Mars, which is awesome, but how can we make <laughs> LA cleaner and better? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of these, you know, future technologies are here, you know, in the palm of our hand, and we have a lot of tools, this, you know, smartphone being one of them. Um, you know, there's lots of neat apps and programs now. There's one, um, there's something called the Good Guide, I believe that's what it's called, that has all kinds of different life cycle and environmental and health um, impacts of products, and you can go to the grocery store and scan what you're buying and see how it's rated. Okay. Um, there's, you know, an app that somebody just approached me about maybe partnering with UCLA, but it's called Park Me that, um, you know, helps you find, uh, you know, parking so you're not driving around looking for parking and wasting emissions, all kinds of solutions like that that you as an individual can engage in. And then there's the basics that you've all heard about, you know, bringing your reusable stuff. There's reusable mug discounts on campus and, you know, reducing your personal impact in that way. But there's a lot of creative, innovative solutions that you can participate in. Um, I'm gonna add to you know what Zach was saying in terms of career, because I think the biggest impact you're gonna have is when you leave this university and go out into the business world. And I think you're spark, spot on about um, cross-functionality. And you know sustainability is inherently a multidisciplinary, multi-sector, multi-department problem. And, and a huge part of getting it done in sustainability is going across, you know, breaking down the silos within your organization, you know, private or public. Um, we have all these different task forces that we work with, with different people from different departments at UCLA, and at a business it's the same. You're gonna need to work with marketing, and you're gonna need to work with purchasing, and getting the right people around the table and taking advantage of that amazing resource that Matt talked about of human ingenuity is a really key piece of it, so. Yeah. I'll just throw out there, I'm a big, <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of fun stuff out there to do. I personally am a fan of the end of ownership. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that information technology enables is virtualization of all kinds of stuff. Over the last 10 years, we've seen it happen with media. Uh, when was the last time anyone in this room bought a CD? Uh, but more importantly, we're, we're now able to apply that to stuff like cars. Yeah. And um, if we look at services like car to go you know, if you're in the city, LA is a really tough city to get around without a vehicle, you can enroll in these kinds of programs where you have easy access to a car, but it's a car sharing program. So you get 98% of the benefit of owning a vehicle uh, without you know, the impact of having yeah. to produce something that's gonna sit in your garage, so. And to bring it home, we have Zipcar here on campus. There's yeah. 18 different cars around UCLA and Westwood, and you get a discount as a student, you can sign up um, to participate in car sharing. And that way, you can bike to campus, but if you need to go across town for an interview, you have the option of taking a car for an hour. And then, so that, 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 that's, that's the bigger one. One last small thing, turn off the lights when you leave the room, people. I, I, um, we, we, we've got the motion sensors, but I still notice that you can actually click and turn it off when you leave. Uh, otherwise, it stays on for 20 minutes. I walk around, I spend, I think, half my time turning off lights in the, uh, the, the locker room. Thank you, room, we uh, need more people out. like you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so if we were traveling, we did that tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, <laughs> yeah, so so assuming we, we all engage in these next steps, uh, now we've reached this perfect world, what does that look like? You know, what, what does the, the corporation of the future look like now that we are, you know, we're, we're taking these steps? I mean, to me, it's about providing a better quality of life with essentially no inputs. I mean, you, you create a closed loop system and anything that comes out of your factory, whatever goes into it is, you have, there's no more going in than coming out. Right. Okay. I would second that, you know, definitely cyclical systems and, you know, and these are starting to exist, you know, a factory where the effluent that comes out of the factory is cleaner than what goes in. There are car engines that, from what I've heard, actually at this point, because of air pollution, the air that comes out is almost cleaner than what's going in, like some of the new diesels actually, um, with the technology they have. So there's that, but I think the, the companies, the future, the organizations, the future, What's important is resilience and adaptability and flexibility. And the world is always going to be constantly changing. I don't think there is a perfect that we're gonna to get to and then we want everything in stasis. What we want is people and companies who can respond to complex systems and to constant change and be innovative and responsive in that way. So that's my kind of vision. That's awesome. All right, so um, we have a few minutes for questions. I wanted to open up to the audience and the floor. Um, Marissa, please. Um, well, first, thank you guys for the panel. You guys have been really, really valuable. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm curious about like how you measure the impact of sustainability, and you touched on how it's such a broad topic across energy and water and waste and food. How do you, in two ways, so how do you, one, measure the trade-off, maybe you're saving energy with using more water, and also in terms of the life cycle, where do you draw the line? Because mm -hmm. I mean, you can go all the way back to the raw materials that you're extracting, but I mean, I've read articles and talked to people, then you can go into like the fertilizer that was used on sure. those crops and the pesticide in there, and there's just like, you, you can go back so many steps, like at what point do you draw the line? Obviously you have to in order to, and it's really important to measure these impacts, so. So one of the things I've seen is you really have to pick the metrics and match the industry. So um, in the finance community, there was a group that published uh, a whole set of guidelines for fund managers to evaluate the sustainability, both environmental as well as social and governance aspects of a company when determining whether or not to, to place funds there. And it really stressed on the environmental front as well as on these other fronts, pick the metric that matches the sector. So I mean, the, the things you're going to look at to measure sustainability in agriculture are going to be different than in telecom, and, and produce metrics around that. Um, you know, I, I did a, a few projects in telecom where the metrics were really energy use in the um, in the facilities, and then just really thinking about the supply chain, uh, particularly the end of life projects uh, with with products. Excuse me, but again, that would have been different if you were working on something else. Yeah, um, I'll definitely second that and kind of expand to say that when you talk about career opportunities um, in sustainability, the area of measurement um, and reporting is, is really a critical one and a very challenging one still. Um, you know, they say you can't manage what you can't measure, and a lot of these things are very tricky to figure out what metrics you should be using. Um, actually, when I was a student here at Anderson, did a neat project for a company where we were helping them figure out what should their key performance indicators be, and we looked at what other companies were managing, and one of the trickiest parts is figuring out what to normalize things by. So this company had a bunch of different factories um, where the products were very different. So are you doing, if you're, it's not enough to just measure waste, there has to be a context. So are you measuring, you know, waste per ton of materials produced? You know, what if one factory produces, you know, toy cars and the other one produces dolls? Um, you know, how do you compare? How do you um, normalize? And so we're facing the same challenges for UCLA. We actually completed this comprehensive assessment under a program called STARS that looks at everything from GHG to you know how many classes you have in sustainability. And figuring out metrics that will work across thousands of diverse institutions in the US um, is very challenging. And figuring out what those normalization factors should be. Is it um, waste per capita? Or is it you know uh, energy use per square foot? And those choices, choosing your metrics has a huge impact on how you end up managing your program. So for instance, we measure waste diversion. So that's percent of your waste that goes to landfill. But if you only measure waste diversion, one way to get your diversion up would be to have everybody drink plastic bottles, drink plastic bottles, drink you know, water in plastic bottles and then recycle it all, right? Or you know, generate more waste but recycle it and divert it from landfill, which overall isn't beneficial. So then you also need to look at waste reduction and find a measurement for you know, tons produced per capita, et cetera. So, um, it's a complex and ever-changing field um, that I think is, is really worth kind of digging into. Um, and there aren't, you know, clear answers. And, you know, there are a lot of what ends up happening is industry-specific, like Zach was saying. So there's all these eco-labels, for instance, for products. So organic for food or fair trade or um, green seal for cleaning products. Um, but people want to compare companies. And there's still, there's been different efforts, but nobody's really succeeded in, in coming up with a way to measure and rate sustainability for corporations overall, so that when you go to the store, you could know, well, Disney's greener than Sony, or, or Sony's greener than Disney, or whatever. Um, and that is still a challenge that's out there. So it would be interesting to see who solves that one. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about, you know, from a finance perspective, we study how uh, financial incentives skew behavior and really can almost ruin things at a company level you have certain incentives from a sustainability perspective, you know, can they be skewed mm -hmm. and, and uh, manipulated? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Please. Okay. This one. So this question is for Nareet. Um, I just had a quick question. You talked about the co-generation plan, and I know that we have 70% of our energy comes from the cogen plant, the other 30%. What 
we have to get from the utility. Um, it, have we been looking into, or does anybody else have other ideas for the other 30% of the energy that we use as far as UCLA's? Yeah, energy. absolutely. So um, just to clarify, you do have your numbers right in that 70% of the electricity we generate at Cogen, um, it actually is 90% of our total energy use. So when you look at um, steam, chilled water, so you know heating and electricity, most of it is Cogen. But, but we do have to buy more from DWP. We can continue to grow as a campus, and we're running our Cogen all out. Um, basically, all we can do for that other part is when the financing is figured out, you know, installing more solar like we did on Ackerman or other on-site renewables that could replace that use. And otherwise, it's, that's where the energy efficiency comes in. And all the projects we're doing to try and conservation and efficiency <coughs> to try and reduce the energy we use, um, you know, we can try and get down to where all our electricity is self-generated, but um, it ain't easy. Especially for us, we've done a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, we've switched out the light bulbs to more efficient, to more efficient bulbs. Um, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement in conservation in terms of the human behavioral aspect. So the areas that don't have motion sensors, getting amazing people like Zach to turn off the lights. You know, how do you engage everyone in those behavioral changes? Turning off your computer at night, all of that will help us as well. So, turn off your computer. Molly, you had a question? Yeah, so in, in her talk, she, she spoke about closing the loop. Um, the example being people have cell phones in the, filling their drawers, and now they're talking and then thinking about, well, how do you design a cell phone such that you can take it apart, recycle it more easily? How do you how do you <laughs> keep the lag time, or how do you incentivize companies um, to think of that in the first place, and um, to sort of shorten that lag time? You know, I was just thinking about this a second ago. Uh, about a year uh, ago, Amory Levin put out a book called Reinventing Fire. We starts tackling that. How do we get the private sector to really jump on rethinking this whole process, and particularly uh, uh, approaching things with transportation, energy, and the built environment? And um, he has some great examples in the book about, uh, particularly the automotive space. How do you, how quickly can you focus on, on modular design? And it was amazingly quickly. Uh, you know, is the technology available? The answer is yes. Uh, the biggest thing that he saw as a roadblock was changing thinking and policy. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get quickly out of school and I start trying to remember the, uh, the specifics, but uh, if you want to get a, get a great lesson in, in, in that, I would suggest that book and through it. Yeah, I think, you know, there are tools we have, policy tools to try and create those incentives, but, and maybe um, it's because I'm passionate about education that I say this, but I think it's true, you know, What's really gonna get us there in part is you guys, is the fact that this next generation of MBA students who will then be the next generation of business leaders are getting this in a different way. And part of it is just old leadership needing to retire. I mean, not that, you know, there are people who've been with companies for generations who get it, but there also are a lot of people who are stuck in kind of older ways of thinking, and I think the next generation is really gonna transform business in a really exciting way. So that gives me hope. You know, all of the surveys of MBA students show that a very high percentage understand that business and environment can, you know, can be mutual goals, that it doesn't have to always be this trade-off. I think one, I don't know if it was the Aspen Institute or somebody was calling it generation and because of that, because they get that it can be profitable and, you know, have a positive impact. So I think part of it is just going to be that natural evolution of new ideas and new people coming in. Um, but, you know, otherwise when you get in there and you're trying to change things, one of the ways to incentivize um, is just old-fashioned incentives. Uh, Ray Anderson is one of my all-time heroes who unfortunately passed away um, last year. But um, one of the things they did at Interface was they had these quest teams and they had prizes or incentives for staff who came up with ways to cut waste. So you can find ways to incentivize people to generate ideas around this. That can be one tool. Um, you know, just old-fashioned pizza party. <laughs> All right, I um, wanted to thank the panel. I think we're out of time, but I wish you this panel